And so just like a side note, you can kind of see them, how they progress onto one another and they progress within each other, if that makes sense. So let's just go ahead and read Psalm 121. It says, I'll lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out, and thy coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I do thank you for today. I thank you for the safe trip over. And Lord, I do pray for each and every one of us in this room to be changed by your word. That we leave here changed people, people that are more like Christ. Now, I just pray for our hearts to be ready to receive your word. I thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 121, if you want to open up to there. And uh, so basically, if you can think of a, a, this psalm as being like a pilgrim song, there's people uh, back in this time would travel to Jerusalem for, uh, you know, three times a year for the different feasts. They had to do a lot of traveling to get there. And so there was the Passover feast, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. They had to make a journey. And it's, they were like, uh, it's like a pilgrimage, so to speak. And uh, they, they may have chanted or sung this song on the way. As we uh, see, you know, the Psalms are meant to be sung, and that's, that's what was going on here. And this is what they, they do to get going. And uh, so there's a very physical aspect to the Psalm, as far as traveling and journeying with families or with groups of people. And you had to get from one place to the other. But there's also, that goes right along with that, there's a very spiritual part of it as well. Because the Bible says that we're pilgrims, right? As followers of Christ, we are pilgrims, right? We're sojourners, strangers. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through, right? And praise the Lord for that as we look around and we can see that uh, this is no place we would want to make our home. And so we want to we want to pilgrim, uh, make a pilgrimage through this life onto the next as we travel toward the celestial city, so to speak. First Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And, and uh, Hebrews 11.13 says this, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so that's us. Right? We are pilgrims on this earth, and so much like the people would be traveling to Jerusalem to get to the temple, uh, we're, we're traveling through this life to get to eternity. Right, And so that's something that we need to keep in mind as we read this psalm. It's filled with, with a lot of truth, really great truth, as God's word is. right, And uh, it's very encouraging. It was to me, like I said, when I read this just through uh, my, my you know, daily reading, I was really taken by it. And so we're going to see our need, first of all, in verse 1, we see our need for help, right? He says, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. And so it's very clear that we need help, right? This verse clearly indicates that, and we cannot deny the fact that we need help. Now, as we, as we look around us, like I said before, we are in desperate need. We need help, and we have to admit that. And I don't think I can say it enough. Sometimes we think we don't. Sometimes we think we have it figured out and we get in a mess, right? This is not saying here, it says, uh, I will lift my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. He's not saying that this help comes from the hills, but the hills is actually where the, the dangers would lurk. If you think of the, the traveling along and you, the hills is where the, the trouble would come as they journeyed. So we're not looking toward the hill for help and and Jeremiah 3.23 kind of clears it up. It says, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. 
So it's not the hills that give the help. The hills here are signifying the evil we must be kept from, which we'll be talking about later, but on the spiritual part of it, the hills would be the evil in this world. And if you, and if you think about where do you find your help, if we understand that we need help, where do we find it? Certainly not in the world. We can't go to any institution and find it. We can't go to a newspaper and find it. We can't go to the legislature or the, the administration, so to speak, to find it. We can only find it in the Lord. That's the only place we're going to find our help. And we need help with lots of things. We need help with the process of sanctification. We can't sanctify ourselves on our own. We can't try harder and be better on our own. We need help. There are thieves who are trying to rob us. Right? So if you think about traveling in those days, it was very hard because you had thieves on the way. People trying to derail you and take you off the path. And if you're living your life for, life for Christ today, you'll know that there's people out there trying to take you off your path. There's a big target on your back as a Christian. People want to see you fall. They want nothing more than to see that. So they can say, where is your God? They're going to rob you of your peace. They're going to rob us of our joy and our, and our victory that we have in Christ. There are uh, sins that would quench the fire of God in our souls if we're not careful. There are problems that would strip us of the glory and power of God. These are all coming in from without and uh, from within as well because we are in our flesh. And our flesh is powerful. And if we're not careful, we can succumb to these dangers that lurk in this world. And we have to constantly be on guard. We need help. Now, when I talk about help, I, when I was thinking about this, I thought of a little toddler, a little kid who needs help. Like putting on their shoes or uh, cutting up their food. But have you ever been around a toddler when they need help? They don't want it. Right? Let me help you with that. No, I don't need help. It's like, no, you literally can't get your shoes on yourself. You do need my help. And then as they get older, they don't necessarily need your help, but they, they ask for it, right? It's like, no, you're, you're old enough. You can, you can do that on your own. But the, the point is, is that we need to be able to receive the help that's, that's provided for us. We need to, to realize that we're like the little toddler that can't get their shoes on, and we just need to have the help. And we need to be thankful for it. So are we willing to seek help this morning? Are we willing to seek it? Are we willing to, to humble ourselves before a holy God who's willing to, to help and have a, bit, a hand in our life and say, oh Lord, please help me? And if so, if we're willing to do that, where are we going to seek the help? Are we going to seek it somewhere other than God, but in man? And I, my prayer is that we seek it from God, the only source of our help, the only one that can truly actually help us. It is wise to look to the strong for strength. When we are weak and feeble and helpless and need strength, wouldn't we turn to the one who has everlasting strength? The God of the Bible, who's, who's all power and almighty, we were, we were just looking at the, the mountains and all the things on the way here and just thinking of the majesty of God and that God who created all that stuff is willing to come into our life and he's willing to help us. If we would just let him, he would come in and he would help us. And he is the strength we need. We can try harder and we can get along a little further on our own, but it's going to fail. It's going to fall short. We can turn to others for help, but they can help us for a short time, but it's going to fall short. They're just people. God will never fall short. And we need to look up for that help to the Lord. And we, do, we can, like I said, we don't look to the world. We don't look to the news. We don't look to, uh, you know, the, the president or the government. We need to look vertical to the Lord. Now, we can find a lot of help in, in the church, can't we? In each other. And I think fellowship with the saints is very important. It's crucial, actually. But, but we have to get the idea that, that it's God that's bringing the help in that. That we can have fellowship with God, 
First of all, and then because of that fellowship with God, we can have fellowship one to another. Now, the beautiful thing about it is in this in, in the world of Christianity, when we're brothers and sisters in Christ, I've never met you, but I know that if you're following God with your life and you have the fellowship with God and I have that same fellowship, then we can help each other and we can be brothers or sisters in Christ instantly. I don't have to get to know you. It's, it's important to get to know somebody, but there is an instant connection because we have that fellowship with God. And that fellowship with God has to be first and foremost. And then that's how we draw help from one another is having that that uh, relationship with God and in the relationship with each other. Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves, uh, assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so our job is, as fellow br- uh, brothers and sisters in Christ is to lead each other to the, to the God who is the hell, the source of the hell. We drive them to the scriptures and we encourage one another when one person's down and the other's up, we need, to, we need to help lift them up. But it's all in the power of Jesus Christ that this is possible. And so again, the, the importance of this fellowship is, is crucial as we look to God for help. Now, verse 2 says, my help. So verse 1 kind of could be a question, really. It's a, it could say, from whence cometh my help, or from where does my help come from, if it's not from the hills. And so verse 2 says, my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And so the source of our help is the one who made heaven and earth. And so if verse 1 is a question, then verse 2 would be the answer to that question. So as we look to God, we need to look with expectancy, desire, and confidence. We need to expect something from God. We need to desire His change in our life, and we be confident in the fact that He'll do it. And what God says is he's, He's confident here, saying, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. There's confidence there, and you can sense that in the writing. Now, that's where God will have us look. We can have confidence in that. We can expect something from God. If we just desire it and look for it, we can expect it. And uh, one thing that's going to happen is the devil is going to come in and he's going to make you focus on yourself. He's going to have you looking at your sorrows and your problems and the issues in your life. And he's going to have you pinpoint them. And that's what he's going to show you. He's going to say, look here. Look right here. How is God helping you in this time right here? How is that happening? Where is God in this part of your life? And he's going to leave you discouraged, and he's not going to be, you're not going to be a help to one another like I was talking about before. Because his idea is to discourage you and to derail you. And if we're not focused on the Lord, then that's exactly what will happen. And so my help cometh from the Lord. We need to resolve to look up to God instead. My help cometh from the Lord. Psalm 124 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Right? And that's, that's again, that's in one of these uh, Psalms, the, the, the degrees, the ascent. As they build up, they, they're going to reiterate a lot of these facts that, that our help is in the name of the Lord. And that's what we need to realize. That's what we need to put our trust in. That's what we need to, to really rest assured in. Because if we're going to do things on our own, we can get ourselves in a lot of, lot of trouble, can't we? When we do things our way, we wind up in a mess. And because uh, our flesh is very strong. And if we continue to let our flesh run rampant, it's going to bring us into destruction. We have to learn how to deny that flesh. Because if we start giving into the flesh and start focusing in on our lives and trying harder, it's going to generate bitterness in us. It's going to generate fear, anxiety, anger. And all these things are generated in us because we're looking to ourselves for help. We're not looking to God for help. We're looking within. And our flesh is going to self-destruct. I was in the jail the other day, and I was was preaching this this, uh, passage, and I was saying kind of the same things as uh, our flesh is going to get us into trouble. We don't have it in our nature to make a good choice. If we do things our own way, it's always going to lead us to a destruction. We're always going to have a problem. And I was going on and on and on. Finally, this guy goes, man, we're in jail. So, yeah, you're in jail. That's what I'm saying. I don't have to convince you that you're in a mess, that you made a mess out of your life. But listen to me, we're no different in here today because we're not in jail as that man that was in jail that day. Our hearts are capable of the very same thing. 
We have this flesh that is so destructive that if we're not careful and if we can't deny it, we're going to wind up in trouble too. I'm not saying that we're going to all wind up in jail, but we do have a big time issue with trouble with these different problems as bitterness, fear, anxiety, and anger, and all these things. But God is present, and there is help, right? He's the help. And so it can paint a pretty bleak picture of what we're capable of on our own, but there's such a glorious picture of what God's capable of in our life. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's something we have to stand on right there because God is so near to us, so present. He is our refuge and our strength, a very present help. God is not so far away from us that we have to somehow work our way toward him. All we have to do is we need to turn to him because he's right there. He's ever present. He's our refuge. What does that mean? It means that we have, a, we have problems and we have to find refuge in something. This world, again, is not where we belong. This isn't how God intended it in our lives. He's our strength. Remember, we need help and we're weak. And he's a very present help in time of trouble. Now we can really find ourselves in a time of trouble. But we have a very present help. Listen to me. God created all things. God made heaven and earth. And what mercy it is that he has to come and help us, right? Let us be joyful in our infinite helper. Everything in this world, everything we can see is at his disposal. He's made all of it. Actually, a funny story that just happened on the way over here. Uh, we were driving along down the interstate, and, and I had this little tiny, uh, I don't know what it like, an inchworm? Like this big, crawling up my pant leg. On the, it's like making that little like this, you know? And I'm like, what is that? And I look at that thing, and there's the tiniest little living thing I've ever seen in my life riding along in the car with us. And in the meantime, I look out the windshield, and I see these mountains, this vast country, the sky, the clouds, and I see that little thing. And God made all of that stuff. And I look at that and say, man, the God who, he's in control of the vastness of space and he's all the way down to this tiny little inchworm or whatever, not even an inch, this whatever, that little silkworm or whatever. I said, man, and that's the God that's willing to come into our lives and help us. The one who's sustaining all that, the one who's holding all that together is willing to come into our lives and, and help us. And he's going to do it and he wants to do it. Because God is, he's for us. He, he wants us to turn to him. He's our infinite helper. So we need to look beyond heaven and earth to who made them both, right? Any other way you find help, I'm going to tell you, any other way we find help is going to be vain. There's no amount of counseling or uh, a godly counsel, obviously, but there, there are institutions or AA or all these different things. And I, and I do believe that they have good intentions and I don't want to, you know, throw rocks at them or whatever, but the only help is really going to come from God. That's it. And look at, uh, or so if we look at other things, so the other things would be like substance, possessions, popularity, all these things, which we all, all seek, right? Relationships, all these different things. And I'm going to tell you that those are not where we get help. Verse three says, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. You see in verse 3, it says, he will not. He will not. That's a promise. And I like to jot that down, a promise. The path of life can be very dangerous. And it says right here in this verse that we shall not be moved. Another way you could say that is we shall not slip. And we're very clumsy people when it comes to navigating life. And it says here that we shall not be moved. Proverbs 3, 23 through 26 says, Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Now, if we read that and understand that, then that's going to give us much confidence, isn't it? 
It should. God is for us. God is on our side. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God's for us, who can be against us? Our pilgrimage will be a safe one with the Lord. As we make our pilgrimage through this life to the celestial city, it's going to be a safe one because we're trusting in the Lord, the one who can keep us, the one that's wanting to protect us and help us. He wants to shape us and he wants to mold us. He wants us to grow and he wants us to be more like his blessed son. The Lord, it says here, he will not slumber. He that keepeth thee will, will not slumber. And isn't it a good that somebody is keeping us? If we're in Christ, there is a somebody that is keeping us, and that keeper is not slumbering. That, that keeper is not asleep. The God of the Bible does not sleep. Amen. That's right. It, and what a glorious thought that is. And again, if we look to God for help, and we look to us, and I don't remember the stat, but, uh, but how long do we spend our, our time sleeping? Right? We, I mean, it's, it shows that how strong we actually are as people, right? But we have a keeper, one who's willing to keep us, and then he doesn't need to sleep. And praise the Lord for that. Because if he did sleep, if God winked his eye, if he slept for one minute, we would just fall completely apart. And so thank God that he doesn't sleep, because we would be in serious, serious trouble. And let me tell you a story. This uh, I used to work in Colorado. I used to live there a while, and I worked in an underground mine. And this mine had a, it was a hard rock mine, and they had the world's longest conveyor belt. In, and I think it still is. It's a 10 mile long belt. So that means that's 20 miles, you know, belt as you, as you do a loop. And so it hauled the material for where the trains used to haul it. They just replaced it with a belt. Now, the tunnel was probably eight miles long. There's two more miles to the mill. But there was a crew down in the mine whose job was to get into a, a locomotive. And what they did every shift is they got in that cart and they rode out to the end of that tunnel right alongside that belt. And then they came back. That was it. One, one time, uh, they, you know, to check the rollers and that stuff. So one time, me and this other guy who weren't on that crew who should have never been on that train, we went because we wanted to go see the tunnel and see the other side of it and see daylight because we've been in that mine, you know. So basically what happened was I was with a guy, and his name was Jim, and he told me how to run the train, and we were coming back, and he said just, you know, here's the brake and here's the throttle and just go real easy because there was a slight grade. Go real easy, he said. You know, just, and you know what happened? Is he fell asleep. The guy who knew how to run the train fell asleep. And so I, in my pride, thought, well, I can do this. And that train started to go faster and faster. And, and pretty soon I'm hitting the brakes. And we are going so fast in this train. It was like a runaway train. And, that was, and, the, and the walls were flying by like this. And here's this guy sleeping. And, and I woke him up. And we got the thing slowed down. We didn't crash, obviously. But, but that's the danger of falling asleep. The one who knew how to do what we should have been doing, the one who knew how to run the train, the one that had our safety under his hand, he fell asleep. And we could have, I mean, it could have been serious if we would have plowed into something. Luckily, we were, you know, and I don't think luckily, you know, but we were, uh, you know, three miles into that tunnel. But there's the danger if somebody who's in control and keeping the situation, which is our God, if he fell asleep, it would be disastrous for us. And so... Because the dangers of this world are always awake. And so praise God that he's awake too. And that he is much more powerful than any struggle that we can have in our life. Any danger we have in our life, God is more powerful than that. And when we praise the Lord that he doesn't sleep because the dangers surely aren't sleeping. First John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's something that we can also hang our head on. So notice thee, in verse 3, it says, um, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. So it's very personal. He's talking very personal right there. And uh, because God's going to deal with us as individuals, right? He's a very personal God, and, and it's a very individualistic God. He, he loves each and every one of us on a personal, individual level, right? And praise him for that. Verse 4 says, he that keepeth Israel 
And so as we see the ascension, remember the, the song of degrees as we build up, he's saying that if he's going to keep one person individually, he can keep the whole, right? And so he's going to work with us as individuals within the church or within this nation here. And, and what, what he's showing us is that if I can keep one of you, then I can keep all of you because I keep all things. And so that's, again, the ascension part. And the church is full of individuals and he keeps the church, right? We're, we can rest assured this morning as we sit here that we're kept of God. We don't have to wonder if God is keeping us. We don't have to, have to you know, wonder if, if, well, maybe him, but not me. Oh, no. It's, a, it's all of us. As long as we're in Christ and as long as we're saved and following him, God is keeping us. And so we don't want to cut ourselves short on what God's able to do in your life. Do not cut yourself short. He wants to use you for his work. God has a plan for you, each and every individual in here. He has a purpose, and he wants to carry it out in us. That's his desire. But we have to, we have to yield to his keeping. We have to quit thinking that we have it under control. We have to quit thinking that we have our own power to operate in because we don't. And then we're going to be cutting ourselves short of what God has for us in that way of thinking. God says, I'll keep thee. I'm not going to sleep. So we need to trust in him. We need to rely on him. We can trust him. Not so much our fellow man, but we can sure trust God. Psalm 60 verse 11 says, give us help from trouble for vain is the help of man. Right? And I think we've all experienced that. Unfortunately, there's been maybe some people that you really trusted that have let you down. But listen to me, God, in you trusting him, he'll he can't let you down. And if you don't believe that, just look toward the cross. In the completed work at Calvary, he cannot let us down. He's he's saved our soul. He's going to continue to to grow us and to work in our life. Now, verse four, and I love this, and this is one of the one of the things that really gripped my heart. Is behold, and I said, "Look, behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep." I think when you think about God not sleeping, and you think about our need of sleep, I think he probably ought to say it again to repeat <laughs> to repeat this truth. Right? It's repeated again. He says it again in verse four. And such a, such a comforting truth, such a, such a great truth, I think, needs to be repeated, right? And he says it right there again at the end of verse 4. He, he'll neither slumber nor sleep. In case you missed it on verse 3, he's going to go ahead and say it again in verse 4. And so, a comforting thought is that we can sleep because he doesn't. So if there's problems going on in our life, we can know that we can get the sleep we need because God is going to be awake. I heard somebody say before, he says, well, if you're up at night and worry, you say, well, I just as well go to sleep because there's no sense in two of us being awake. Right? And uh, now if I could just sometimes get the children to, to think that way, is, is sleep is good and God's awake, right? But because of this truth, us Saints making the pilgrimage to the celestial city can do so in peace. One of the most, like the, the evidence of our life of having peace is that actually being able to just go to sleep. Right? Like you, you look at a lot of people in a lot of trouble, they, they, they're kept up at night. But if they could have really truly grasp the peace of God, that wouldn't be the case. And we could... Uh, as far as anxiety and worry and fear and those kinds of things, right? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Those things will make us go to sleep. And the Bible says that our sleep can be sweet. Amen, right? And I love that, that thought of that. Again, in verse 4, if he shows mercy to one, he shows blessings to all. All who are in Christ are going to receive these blessings of God because he's able to, if he's able to do it to one, he's able to do it to all of them. That's us, the church. 
And here he's speaking of his chosen nation who eventually will deny Christ and all of those things. And um, he's, just, he's talking about the whole lump of God's people as being the nation Israel. And so we can look at that as being grafted into that in Christ, that we have the same promise and we have the deliverance from God and we have the peace of God and we know that God is keeping us. And again, that's, it's very, it seems to be like I'm repeating myself, but it's something that we have to get. That God is keeping you today. He includes us today in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we're included in that. In Christ. Verse 5 says, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Now in verse 5 here, you kind of get to realize who, who this God is. He's speaking of Jehovah God. He's speaking of the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible is the keeper, right? Not our own idea of who God is. The God is it's only accessible through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who the God we're talking about here. That's our God here today on his throne, high and lifted up in control of all things. Nothing in the world right now is going on is surprising God. Nothing going on in our life is a surprise to God. He knows and he cares. He's on his throne, and if we trust Christ and be kept in the only one who can do the keeping, right? That's what we must do. We can't take the Bible and read it and try to fit it into our lives. We need to take our lives, and we need to have the God's word get into our lives and change it. I think so, much, so often what happens is, is somebody will say, well, I don't really like that part of the Bible, but I like this part. And what happens is you start ignoring the truths of the Bible because they're going to start confronting you. They're going to start convicting you, and it's going to be hard to change. It's going to be hard to conform to the image of Christ. It's going to be hard to deny our flesh and do what we need to be doing as long as God's telling us to do it. But I'll tell you, if we can be obedient in those things, then we're going to experience blessings that, that are unimaginable. But there's so many people that are they're, they're cutting themselves short because they're forming God. They're basically taking out a pocket knife and they're whittling their own God to worship it because they've departed from the God of the Bible. And so in verse 5, it's very clear which God we're talking about. here. This isn't a whittled God. This isn't man's God. This is the God of this book. And we have to watch it. We have to listen to it. And we have to let it conform us. And, and we have to be obedient to it. Though it be hard, sometimes growing can be hard, right? And then we, it talks of a shadow in verse 5, and I think that has to do, if you think again back to the physical aspect of this, those people are walking in, in treacherous conditions, really, the blazing sun, the blinding, and God is saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shadow you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to give you shade, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, they don't know if they had, you know, cool shades back in those days. But he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect your eyes from the glaring, the, the glaring brightness. Right? And he's going to do it on where? Your right hand. That's the most useful one. Again, if you, and if you look to our life as Christians in this psalm, in our most usefulness, that's what God's going to be protecting. The most useful part of our lives, that's what God's going to do with his shadow. And another great truth here, with God's protecting our right hand, he's, he's got a purpose for us, and he's going to protect that, and he's going to see it through. And how near is God to us today? It's not that sunny out, but if you go outside, well, you can probably do it here. you got a shadow. You know, sometimes my kids like to step on the shadow. But that's how near God is to us. As near to us as our shadow. Now that's pretty near, right? And so turn to him today. Psalm 91.11 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, I want to dwell under that shadow. And so that's what we need to be today. That's available to us today. And then finally, we're going to see the, the work, the helps. The helps work. In verse 6, here's what, here's what it does. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Even the most powerful forces 
can't hurt us. We're talking about the sun and the moon. Those are pretty powerful forces, I would say. And I'm sure all of you know, but if you think about this, the position of the earth in relation to the sun speaks volumes on God's love for us. I've heard it said that if we're any closer to the sun than we are right now, we would just burn up. And if we were any bit further away from it than we are right now, we'd freeze. We are in the exact position in the earth in relation to the sun that we have life because of it. And that alone should, should persuade you to trust in the Lord. That's God's work. Psalm 91.5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And so we see a contrast here. And that's one thing as far as studying the Bible that I've always looked for is a contrast. There's, there, you can learn so much when, that, when those are happening in the scriptures. Um, here we see a contrast between the sun and the moon, right? So we have troubles in the day and we have troubles in the night, right? And then you see lightness and dark, right? We're going to have, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems in poverty. We're going to have problems in riches. They both, they, what I'm saying is that no matter what's going on in our life, we're never going to achieve something here on earth that's going to be perfect. Except for our relationship with Jesus Christ Amen. and our spiritual life found in him. So we're kept by the creator, verse 7, says the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Now, when it says preserve, since we're on the theme of keeping, it's, it, it can be, you could say that and keep it, that the Lord shall keep thee from all evil. So preserve, keep, same idea. So he's going to, what is he going to keep? What is he going to preserve? Your soul. He's going to keep and he's going to preserve your soul. He's going to keep us in, in the evil world. We're, we're still here, Right? And But so he's preserving us and he's growing us in it to be more like his son. He's making us fit for heaven is what he's doing. And he's going to use this world and the troubles in it to teach us and to show us and to make us grow and to conform us and, and make us into the image of his son. Evil's both great and small. Even little tiny problems in our life can generate a lot of issues as well as the, one, the, what big, the big ones. Right, that, that lands you over in the, in the prison or the county jail. But even just the smaller sins in our life are just as destructive. That's what we have to, we have to see here. And so do we actually believe this morning that God is keeping us in those? As we look around and everything is evil, everything may be seeming to fall apart in your life. We get into these situations where we don't see an end what is God doing? Why is this happening? We really just need to believe that God's keeping us in here and, and he's keeping our soul. He's growing us. He's shaping us. And it's going to be for the good because only God is only good. But the problem is, is our flesh is what tends to get in the way of all this. We think that he can't. We start doubting. And what that is, is unbelief. But listen to me, it is our souls that are kept until glory. And we're being sanctified day by day. If we would just yield to the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and not after the flesh, we could do well to see what God's doing in our lives and conform to that. And um, here's a one preacher said this, quote, God keeps the... God keeps the soul from the dominion of sin, the infection of error, the crush of despondency, the puffing of pride, kept from the world, the flesh, and the devil, kept for holier and greater things, kept in the love of God, kept not the eternal kingdom, kept in the eternal kingdom and glory. What can harm a soul that is kept of the Lord? What could? 
Romans 8, 38, 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did he leave anything out in that list? Is there anything in your life that is, that is in there? You say, oh, this can keep me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No, it's complete. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing that can cancel his keeping us. There's nothing we can do to offend him so much that he's going to let us go our own way. He's going to constantly, not sleeping, be abiding in our life closer than a shadow, and we can trust him, and we can grab a hold of him, and he can change our lives. I don't care where you're at today or what kind of trouble we've got ourselves in, but he can redeem it. He can, he can reclaim the life. He can uh, build it back up. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing. And so we often look and say, well, my life is too hard. God can't overcome this. Listen to me, he can. And these are the scriptures that can show you the truth that he will. Verse 8 says, the Lord shall preserve thy going out. Thy coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. He keeps us our, in our day-to-day -day life, right? As getting up in the morning, going to work, and coming home. He's keeping you. If you're in school, you get up in the morning and go to school and come home, he's keeping you. If you do school in your house, when you make your way to your desk, and out to the to lunch table and then back to your desk, he's keeping you. No matter what we're doing, we're kept. All the way on a bigger scale, and again with the ascension part of the psalm, you think of a day-to-day -day life. We all have it. We all have a routine. We all do something during the day, and we're kept in that day-to-day. -day. But if you think about it on a bigger scale from when we're born and to where we, uh, you know, when we're, reborn, and we come to glory, we're kept. So the little inchworm and the big mountains were kept. Deuteronomy 28, 6 says this, Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. So not only are we kept, but this verse says that we're blessed. Right? It'd be one thing to keep us, but boy, it's better than that. We can be blessed by it. In verse 7 and 8, the, I was trying to figure out this. It was of this Greek stuff, and I don't, I don't know, I'm not much of a Greek person, but I, I liked what I, what I come out the other end here. So basically, in, in, that, when, in the language, it was the Lord shall reserve, keep thee. It says that three times in, the, in those two texts. You could translate it. So it's basically a three-time guarantee that the keeping is eternal. And so... Uh, I thought I included that on there, but anyway, I didn't. So uh, basically, this keeping is eternal. It says, the, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. So the Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul, and he shall preserve thy going out. Preserve, preserve, preserve. Keep, keep, keep. Again, like if we, if we see that in God's word, if we see anything repeated, it's worth paying attention to. If we see anything one time in here, it's worth paying attention to. He says it three times in two verses. Preserve, preserve, preserve. That's God's promise. That's God's guarantee. And so I'll end with this. We need to remember when we start to sense our weakness. Does anyone in here ever sense their own weakness? Right. We're weak. But remember, in that weakness, when you sense that weakness, it'll remind us of our need. And when we're reminded of that need, in that, in that way of thinking, when we know, I really need help. Remember the one who does the helping. And remember the one that does the keeping. And as we read in Deuteronomy here at the end, the one who does the blessing. That there's blessing found in all of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your keeping us, your preserving us. You're moving in our life. 
And Lord, we thank you that we were once alienated from you, that we've offended a holy God and we've been removed from you. And in our sin and our rebellion, Lord, you chose to send us your son. And God, we just have ruined everything and you seen it fit to save us. But you've made a way in your son, Christ, the dying on Calvary's hill on the cross. That Christ said he came into the world to live a life that we were intended to live and he died a death that we deserve in our place as a substitute. He was buried and rose again, Lord, and it's in our belief in that that we can be saved. That we can experience these blessings. We can experience your keeping and your uh, preserving us in this present wicked world. I thank you for the peace that you offer in Christ, that we can look around us at gas prices and bad administrations and corrupt government and all these different things, and that we can have peace, Lord, and that we can sleep well at night in that, knowing that you're in control and that you're awake. God, help these truths to sink into our hearts this day and help us as we move into the morning hour, Lord. Just be with us. Thank you for your word. The truths found therein. God, help us to conform our lives to it. And help us in our unbelief, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Tiny.